your greenhouse boy number three. Yes. Uh, with again a very different setup. One that's probably uh, easiest to uh, obtain for people thinking yeah. about this this thing. You know the way it's set up. And I'm just I'm just very curious uh, how it's set up. There's a pair of anoles in there. Yes. But I'm mostly curious about the setup itself, how it's built, why you build it with the materials. Yes. And let's do a plant tour. Let's look at all the cool plants you have okay. in here. Yeah. Tell a little bit about the materials. Okay, first. for the materials I used uh, an aluminium frame. Yeah. Uh, the aluminium frame is from a system called Alustek. You can configure it by yourself online and then just order the parts that you need in yeah. the length that you need it in and you get these connector pieces to set it up. Yeah, and I built the frame out of the aluminium. The bottom part is um, covered with PVC. The back part is covered with PVC, the sides and the front uh, are glass. Yeah, the I think biggest difference to a terrarium this size are the doors because I didn't want to have sliding doors because I wanted to have access to nearly every part of the background. Yeah, because I want to make it accessible everywhere. With sliding glass, problem would be with this, this height this would get very heavy and yeah everything is glued into place with silicone i used some semi-transparent airflow blockers for for doors or whatever for windows that you can glue over there so no animals can get in or out because you when you build this you want to have like some room in between because if you don't have it you can't open it if you didn't calculate right this can get expensive, so I left some room. I have some classic ventilation over there and over there. Here are some PC fans to uh, get some air into it, but I think it's not optimal yet because I have some more velvety anthurium species that don't like to have water on their leaves and that way the leaves will die off. The ventilation is not strong enough to shake all the uh, mm. water from the leaves. You try to push in air. Yeah. But if you pull out air, it works way better. Yes? Yeah. Okay. So you want try. them on here and then pulling. Yes. And that way you get a low pressure area in your terrarium and it pulls in, pulls in new oh, that's air. That's smart. That's, that's way more effective. Okay. That's a great idea because <laughs> also there's the window. So if I... Just open it. Yeah. Everything will go that way. Why not a big terrarium? I had already experience with the aluminium frame and I thought it is the most stable and also lightweight uh, method to use it. PVC is perfect because it won't get moldy because it's very wet in here. And you would have not have gotten it into your bedroom probably. Yeah. That's another part. So if I have to move, I can tear it apart. Maybe need to get some new connectors, but yeah. these cost like one or two euro per piece. So that's not the issue. On top, I put a, one of these plates that you use when you build a greenhouse. This was super good because it was so easy to just drill into it for the misting system. Another aspect that I got from a classic terrarium, a terrarium are the glass walls. Mm. I definitely wanted to have it very open because there's my desk. I can sit there and um, yeah, watch, watch, watch it your, from yeah. the side. And if I just would use uh, glass on the front, yeah. I think it would, wouldn't look so open. It would look more crowded uh, and that way I can get more out of it. Yeah, and it's really big. What's the size? It's, um, oh, I think it's one meter and 10 centimeters long, 60 centimeters deep hmm. and uh, two meters, 35 high. And there's just enough space for the lamps to 
uh, lay on it. It's, yeah. it's really narrow uh, yeah. compared to the height. So it's indeed, like you said, crazy that there's only a jungle dawn and yeah. the T5 on top of that. That's right. I had the image of something green, something jungle themed and I always like moss so I was like ha, a moss wall or a plant wall would be nice and I was inspired by moss poles like this these are the typical moss poles you see uh, aeroids climbing in like this wonderful philodendron splendid I thought why don't make it as a surface and <laughs> combine it with the misting system and I think the interesting part is to see how light is everything it's so crazy i when i read something like this i was like yeah okay come on humidity and mm. uh, nutrients are also important they are but i underestimated how powerful light is because you see here the upper part is way greener than the rest of it and that's because here is the most light down there it's not so much light, but enough, enough for the plants to grow. But the moss got so powerful <laughs> with the light and all the grasses and ferns you see and some of the other plants there weren't inserted by me. They grew out of the moss. And yeah, for the process, I drilled some uh, hooks into the aluminum frame and uh, then I made four big moss patches just out of this grid. The grid is something like PVC or plastic, so it can't rot. Yeah, the first mistake I made was just making a, a double-sided grid, filling it with moss and hanging it into the hooks, and all the moss fell down. <laughs> like, oh shit. So I had to take it up, lay it on the ground, flatten all the moss, close it, with uh, like, how do you say? Zip ties. Zip ties, yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh, with zip ties on the um, edges. And then I had to put zip ties in the middle and zip it tight so uh, that it's flat and the moss is fixed so it can't just rush down. And then I just had the nice opportunity to attach everything everywhere because it's so flexible. So I bought some Anturium Vaichi seeds. When the uh, seeds emerged and got their first leaf, I could just stick it into here. And here you see it hasn't grown that much, but here are two little leaves. And yeah, with small plants like this, you just poke them in there. You don't have to do any extra work. And with uh, bigger plants like this Philodendron, Tenui, you just take it and take some more zip ties and just zip tie it on the background and when you want to cut it down because it gets too big you can see it takes a lot of space in here it blocks a lot of light yeah i just could cut the zip ties and carefully wiggle it out of the moss cut some parts off and take this beautiful plant lower it and just zip tie it again but uh, i think it's time that I have to cut back the bigger leaves or take it out entirely because you can see it was like here and you see it's the moss is looking okay here are ferns and everything okay but uh, this is a different level and the light that the philodendron takes away yeah avoids the life <laughs> from spreading yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. regular back cutting is definitely necessary. Like I said, the ferns and the grasses that grow here grow out of the moss. When you are lucky, you have moss and uh, fern spores into, in your moss. I used a mixture of dried sphagnum moss, living like <laughs> second choice uh, sphagnum moss and some orchid bark. And with that, the plants that had some spores in there also came to life. Look at this fern and look at the downside of the leaves. These are spores. Here are the formatured. They're like darker. And that's how new ferns will grow, hopefully. So that's pretty cool. I like it very much.
This is some Anturium, Anturium Ducey. And this is the newest leaf just emerged. That's, yeah, Anturiums unfurl their new leaves and they are pretty small and often different colored than the when they are finished and they get their new little baby leaf and you're like oh that's so small and it grows and grows over the next weeks and evolves its uh, its color uh, a nice philodendron verucosum variation and a beautiful red down here and this can vary the amount of the red on the downside can vary depending on how how much light you give them here it grows over here and look at that isn't that beautiful these will grow into there with their they, they spread out their aerial roots and try to find something to climb on and eventually they will get here and then will root into the back wall get attached and that's interesting with climbing philodendrons when you give them um, the opportunity to climb and give them something to hold on to, they develop bigger leaves. The uh, Monstera oblica Peru. I got this as a runner. Sometimes these, when they don't have enough light or not the optimal place, they uh, build like a runner that's just some stem with root that runs to the light. And the nice part of the, about the runners is when you just cut them everywhere where root is, you have a new plant. This is the Philodendron paloarense and Philodendrons often uh, change, slightly change the size of the formation of the leaves. Younger leaves are just thin and uh, the older adult leaves have like these horns. So when it grows bigger it will get this. That's always the thing when you uh, buy a cutting with an adult leaf you're like ah oh, the next ones will look like that. No, it's uh, starting somewhere smaller. So I have to wait until these will get nice. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's a part that's stretching out and rooting. So you could just break it off and have a new plant. We can always dream about the version 2.0 yeah. or 3.0. How would it look? Okay, um, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, the bottom part. You've seen that there are like plastic bins down there. I didn't thought about drainage or some opportunity to leave the water out. So if I had to rebuild something like this, I would think of a smarter way to catch water and maybe extract it out of this thing. With the um, moss patches I'm very happy I would do this again but the lightning is some part that I'm currently rethinking so that's something that I w will maybe change or um, yeah upgrade. The two lights up here are great for the upper part. It is definitely en enough to have these plants down here grow or the plants there but um, if I had more light in this intensity down here the whole thing would look so different it, if everything was like this green hmm. ah, that would be my dream okay so here you have a big PVC uh, setup yes. in your living room and also here we see a lot of plants yes it doesn't look like there's too much substrate, so I wonder which plants you put in here that do well for mm -hmm. other people to learn from and also maybe how you like approached it. Okay, mostly it's again aeroids, different philodendron species, one monstera. These are like climbers, these can grow epiphytic, so they don't need a big load of nutrients. Substrate level is pretty low, but there are all, all over the place are uh, little branches, sticks. I regular put in new leaf litter because there are different kinds of isopods and springtails in there that work with the leaf litter. 
uh, I decided to uh, for cacao leaves because they suit the habitat the best I think and I like the the look of them. Someone on Instagram wrote me that I'm stupid because I spent money on leaves but I think it makes a difference when I collect the leaves from outside it won't look as nice and natural uh, with the with the concept that I had in mind. If you use natural fertilizers every now and then you can also give the plants some 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 more love. So you give some some fertilizer and you chose uh, plants that are more epiphytic or that are like a uh, trail trailing plants. Yes, yeah, trailing yeah. plants. And now Till, now we've seen the nice plants in here. Can you please tell us what's living in here? Oh yeah, uh, there are frogs in here. I have two Dendrobates auratus in there. Frogs are like a pest control in there. So they will eat all that stuff to keep it low um, so that the isopods won't take over and eat all the plants. So I love my frogs, but the frogs uh, <laughs> fulfill a purpose in there. The original pet is a uh, yellowtail indigo, net, uh, indigo snake, uh, Drumachon corais, uh, which comes from the regions where these beautiful plants also grow. And Drimagon is a, it's a big snake and it's an active snake. Yeah. And still you have a setup full of plants. Yeah. So that's what I think is really cool. Of course, it's not easy, but even in a relatively small space with a relatively big animal, you are able to maintain some, some good looking plants. Yeah. Most of the plants look healthy. I'm sure they sometimes take a beating, For but sure. they, it, it looks absolutely great. Thank you. Of course, you have to make some compromises. Uh, you have to um, take the risk. So when I put a plant in there uh, and he kills the plant, I don't have to be angry about him because <laughs> I put the plant in there. So uh, best you can do is like check before. Don't just throw any plants in there. I see so many people like just go to the to the plant market or the hardware store and get the same three plants you see in every vivarium regarding of where they come from or what they need because when you get an animal you also look up what does this animal need and you have to do the same with the plants. I would prefer to take at least plants that thrive under, under the same conditions as my animal. Of course I had some uh, plant loss in there but uh, I can tell you that uh, most of the plants are here, in here, as long as the snake. Yes, you, you have opportunities to, secu to secure them, like I took little plant cages that you use for a pond and uh, planted my plants for the vivarium in there and secured it with zip tie and uh, mesh so that the plants have the opportunity to grow through the grid outside of the, the cage but the snake doesn't have the opportunity to get to the core of the plant and dig it out. I told you the Philodendron marmai, the crawling one, got knocked over, but this was already at a part where it grew out of the cage by itself. The new part was already rooting inside the enclosure, so I just can take off the cage now because I don't need it anymore. So that is just an example how you can try things out. <laughs> don't let anybody tell you that uh, <laughs> this doesn't work out. So. Just, just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect.